So we've brought Emily back in to do a follow-up now. Um, on what it was like to go through the hurricane. So over the next kind of half an hour or so here, we're going to chat about a few things, I guess. Uh, ask her a little bit about what happened during the storm. Uh, what were some of the big lessons and takeaways? Emily's done a lot of amazing work mobilizing for responses to the Orlando shooting and uh, other different events that have happened around the United States. Uh, so I think she's got some thoughts on, you know, things that you can be doing in your own community to just be proactive and, and mobilize with your friends. Uh, to be more resilient and adaptable in changing times. And hopefully that helps us hold a more optimistic uh, and hopeful outlook. So with all that said, uh, I'd love to pass it over to Emily to say hello right now. So Emily is from the, the Florida School of Holistic Living down in Orlando. Uh, and she also works a lot with the uh, Herbal Action Network and the Orlando Grief Care Project. So, uh, hey, Emily. How are you yeah. doing? Hey, Chris. And hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am uh, out here this weekend uh, just south of Portland, Oregon at the American Herbalist Guild Symposium doing some teaching and gathering with some amazing herbalists out here. The theme of the conference this weekend is herbalism in action. And it feels really great to be um, out here having these bigger discussions in the herbal community and also be on here tonight with y'all and with Chris to continue the conversation about um, the work that we've been doing and also um, just like to yeah keep reflecting on experiences like Hurricane Irma and Maria and Harvey and the shootings in Orlando and Las Vegas and um, most especially just the things going on in each of our communities and how we can be um, more resilient and prepared for those so I've learned a lot from Chris in this last month as I've gone through Hurricane Irma and um, I'm just grateful to continue the conversation so thanks y'all for being here this evening it's great to be chatting with you. Awesome. Well, maybe we can start off before we really kind of dig into some of the big lessons uh, that came through your experience with Irma. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Herbal Action Network uh, and, yeah. and some of the great stuff that you guys are up to? And yeah, absolutely. Thanks. The Herbal Action Network um, came about last summer after the work of the Pulse shooting where we began to connect with hundreds of herbalists around the country who supported our project down there, which we'll talk a little about, bit more about tonight. And um, as we began to build these connections with other herbalists, we saw other situations in the community um, in the United States, such as the shootings in Minneapolis and in Louisiana, where the Black Lives Matters movements were responding. And we saw a lot of different ways that our herbal community could begin to connect and respond across states. Um, and across gardens to share with one another. So um, at herbalactionnetwork.org, um, we're starting to build a library of resources to share among communities so that none of us have to really um, start from scratch, but can look to different models that have gone on around the around North America in response to different, um, both natural disasters and political tragedies. And then also so that um, those of us involved and interested in this work can just be more connected and, and remain in touch and in communication and that calls to actions can be more effectively shared um, among the herbal lines. So. Ah, awesome. Yeah. I mean, really that's, that's the big reason behind, you know, why I started changing world project and what the vision for it was, was really not having to start from scratch and, you know, mm -hmm. bringing innovative minds together and people sharing their experience, uh, sharing what they're learning, sharing challenges. Um, yeah. And so we're all, we're all kind of working together to, to face some of the, yeah, the challenges of the future. So mm -hmm. uh, I love the vision of the Herbal Action Network. This is great. So let's, let's maybe start, we could do a really, really quick recap of kind of where we, what we chatted about last time. So last time we chatted, um, it was, I think, about 12 to 24 hours out before mm -hmm. Irma was about to hit Florida. I think it was literally moving across the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the ocean there after just hitting Cuba uh, and was picking up steam. And uh, maybe you could just start by sharing a little bit about what it looked like in Orlando and, and what you were hearing about around Florida before the storm. And for anyone listening at home, I just encourage you to think about, you know, uh, even though you don't live on the coast and maybe you're not going to be in the eye of the hurricane, there's kind of principles that apply across a lot of different kind of emergencies and situations. So uh, I encourage you and challenge you just to kind of broaden your, your perspective on this and think about, you know, how could this apply to any kind of situation that you might be in and, and what kind of lessons, you know, could you take away with this? Uh, what action steps come away that would make you more prepared to deal with anything out of the blue that comes up? Uh, I'd encourage you to maybe even take a couple notes as you go in his cool kind of light bulb thoughts, uh, share them in the chat box as we go. Um, but yeah, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, kind of before the storm and what it looked like and maybe if there was anything that kind of surprised you um, in the lead up to the storm. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And yeah, y'all, you know, I was talking today with some folks about what happened in Hurricane Irma. And at the same time, there were wildfires going on in Oregon. And we recently had earthquakes going on in Mexico. So wherever you're tuning in from, there's always these um, natural or, you know, like big issues that are always at play and unexpected. So um, for me, when I was preparing uh, for Irma, I was um, calling upon, you know, living in Florida all my life. Hurricanes are not something that are new for me and I have a checklist from many decades of you know filling this and gathering that and making sure I not have tested my batteries for this and that um, and as I was working with Chris and chatting with him a little bit before the hurricane um, the big things that stood out for me were the opportunity to prepare things before uh, the disaster or the emergency actually hits. I um, had been traveling a lot. I shared with Chris, I've been traveling a lot in the prior year out to North Dakota to do work in Standing Rock. Um, through that and a variety of other circumstances, my first aid kit and my preparedness kit were somewhat disassembled, weren't necessarily all um, together in the best place. I had been traveling out of state teaching in the weeks prior to Irma, and so I only had a few days at home where I was able to really assess my checklist and gather things in my pack. And I was um, getting my pack, in, my pack together and getting things at my house in order um, during the few days prior when the media was just incessantly um, messaging folks in Florida and in the islands with big, big messages of fear. And absolutely, these types of storms are forces of nature that need to be respected uh, humbly by us humans, and we do need to be prepared accordingly. But the way that the media was messaging fear, it was really breeding and rising up in the community. The tension and anxiety was escalating. And so even for someone like myself that felt fairly prepared compared to perhaps the average citizen, um, it was hard not to get wrapped up in that fear and to feel this like undercutting of anxiety. And even if one was not to be, you know, glued to social media all the time and watching these like images of the storm get closer and closer to you, just in nature, in the atmosphere, there's a tension that arises when a hurricane comes. Um, you know, the, we watch, if we, if we look to nature um, to inform our emergency preparedness, we see the birds leaving and we see the animals scurrying and we feel these different patterns you know, of nature emerging. And so um, big lesson number one uh, through before, during, and after the storm coming through Florida was um, take the opportunity to prepare before the emergency is at your back door. Um, I certainly was grateful that in my community, Irma was not as devastating as it could have been um, because that gave me a chance to get my preparedness needs a little more in order and feel a lot more calm and grounded to enter the next storm as it approaches. Um, so definitely number one was um, getting prepared when you're not in the middle of it. Yeah. One of the things that really stood out to me, I, I was thinking about, because you were talking about how a couple days before the storm, people were already really panicking in the streets and, you know, huge lineups and people starting to argue and, you know, all these things coming on. And it really made me think that, you know, a lot of that stress and anxiety, uh, for one, that burns a ton of calories and uses a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're scrambling the couple of days before that incident, uh, then you're going into the worst part of it already at a low level, energetically, mm -hmm. already stressed out and scrambled on your mind. Uh, so one thing it really made me think about, you know, hearing that a couple of days before the storm, while everyone else was scrambling, you were just kind of tweaking little things but you were actually spending time in your garden. You were making mm -hmm. sure you were going to bed early and getting mm -hmm. really good long sleeps, knowing that once the storm hits, you might not sleep for who knows days, depending on how yeah. it rolls out. Uh, so I thought it was a really amazing lesson on just how being proactive and prepared actually allows you in those moments before to get into a proper headspace, which is huge, you know? Uh, and to not have to be out on the streets in a more dangerous situation, panicking to get water and actually be at home getting enough sleep to have the energy to be able to perform at your best you know, calling your loved ones while you still have the phone, getting last little communications in. Uh, so I thought that was one of the big takeaways I took from it, you know, it was just how calm you were um, mm -hmm. and the connection between that and the fact that you had given a little bit of forethought to some of these things, so. Absolutely. So what if we, if we jumped ahead a little bit, uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, when the storm actually started. I remember getting a couple like intermittent Facebook messenger mm. messages from you, you know, about the wind picking up and it being dark or 
Yeah. Uh, and then even I think a real beautiful rainbow that came through before the storm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. The 24 hours before the storm, um, there was, you know, certainly that movement in the atmosphere, rain feeder bands coming through the birds, you know, very obviously leaving. Um, and that really, you know, nice, big, beautiful rainbow um, during sunset, uh, the, right after the hurricane had passed the evening after. Um, can, I, can I jump yeah. in for a second? What did you, with the birds specifically, when did you pick up on a difference in bird activity behavior. Do you remember a moment of actually noticing that? I'm curious. I definitely noticed. um, So the storm, I live inland, about an hour and a half inland off the coast um, in Orlando, Florida, central Florida. Um, The storm arrived, the eye of the storm arrived to my neighborhood about midnight on Sunday uh, evening and Sunday morning. I was out in my garden um, and I started to notice like some flocks um, especially some of the water birds that were very visibly flying north. Um, and then shortly, uh, maybe around midday, again, out in the garden, noticed a couple of the larger birds of prey um, flying during the day, things like um, hawks and owls that you may normally see in the later hours. So, um, so yeah, I was just, you know, within maybe 12 to 18 hours was when I noticed. Um, and also, Chris, I'm living in a city and I, my right. tracking skills are very urban at this point in time. So, sure, awesome. I, uh, yeah. I'm curious if there was an actual spot where bird language just completely plateaued and went dead. Um, and I don't know if you picked up on that. If you don't have an answer, that's fine. But I'm, I'm really curious if you mm-hmm. were to kind of plot the bird language on the map in the, the 12 hours, even 24 hours, 48 hours before, and then during and after. It'd be really interested yeah. in that. Yeah, the aftermath is something that actually a lot of my friends noticed, like when the birds first started to return to our neighborhoods. And it took really several days um, okay. before the birds came back. So. so do you think they actually left the area altogether? Was that your take or did they just hunker I, down? No, I believe they, they actually left the area is my understanding. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. So anyways, we were chatting about uh, during the storm and what, what it was like for you as it started kind of coming in. And maybe, again, I'd love to hear if there, you know, what you felt you, were, you did well in preparing yeah. for it. Uh, and then if there was things that kind of surprised you and things that would be do different, or I would definitely want to get this in place, uh, focusing on the like actual during the storm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, During the storm, um, I did feel uh, pretty prepared and calm. Um, I had shared with Chris the night before that I did have walkie-talkie systems set up with several of my neighbors. Um, So, and I also had, you know, um, I guess backup uh, housing with them. If my house were to have a breach of any kind, I could escape over to a neighbor's house. And that really made me feel really secure. Um, The weather radio was also something that was really important because once the um, power, once the electricity went out, being able to continue to get the alerts of when a tornado was coming through our area um, in that type of thing was really um, important. Um, I was still, I didn't lose electricity until um, really maybe like 11 o'clock at night. Like it was really, the eye of the storm came through between I think 1.30 and 3 a.m. where I was. So um, I was, you know, blessed to have um, power quite late into the evening. So um, I was like furious, like scurrying around the kitchen, baking more brownies and um, (laughs) getting my medic pack a little more organized and well-labeled and trying to get some of those things together. And I think that was one area that I had also expressed to you that um, I certainly wish I had uh, been able to get those things a little more organized Mm -hmm. before the storm, because if I had needed them during the storm, I would have been fumbling around a bit to find the, you know, this type of Band-Aid and that type of suture. So it was really um, nice and a luxury to have the power on as late as we did. Um, One area that I felt um, not prepared for was communications when the comm system went down. So when the electric went out, a lot of the internet grids also went down in my community. And a lot of us in the States have, um, for many years now, abandoned our landlines for our phones Mm. and only carry around cell phones. And so when the cell towers go down or when the internet towers go down or even, you know, when your electricity goes out and your internet box is no longer working, Working, then you're suddenly cut off from a measure of communication to the outside world. And I had shared with you that my mother lives about an hour north of me. And um, I had 
always in the past on my hurricane checklist on the little section where it says like family communication plan type line. I always like envisioned that being my laminated three by five card with everyone's numbers written down instead of locked in my like little pocket robot and not accessible. And so um, to really have talked to you about and think about having a communication plan with my family um, once those communication systems go down, whether it's some type of radio or some type of um, midway point or someone that we speak to out of state, um, that's something that um, wasn't available to me. And in the first you know, period of time after the hurricane, there was intermittent um, cell phone and internet accessibility. We would have cell power up for an hour on the day or two after, and then it would go down for a day as they were fixing a line, and then it would go back up. And so those... Um, that insec communication insecurity, I think, is the best way to call it. Like, not being able to reach my family at times and let them know that things were okay um, was something that I felt anxious about during the storm as I was, you know, watching um, the devastation happen in other parts of the state as it was rolling through. For sure. Um, and some folks, uh, if you haven't thought about this before, I don't know if everybody in here knows this, you know, some people maybe that were born into the, the digital, digital era and started off, you know, with cell phones being a norm. Uh, if you have a phone that actually plugs directly into the wall and still has a cord on it, um, those phones will still work when the power's out because they don't need electricity. They're running and powered through a phone line. Uh, and I think a lot of people actually don't even know that anymore. I mean, that was common knowledge when I was a kid growing up. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can have no electricity at your house and still have a working phone line if you have a cord phone that, um, that ha that's a corded phone uh, that plugs right into a phone line. So there's something to think about. We never use ours, but we have one in our house. I think we pay $9 a month to keep it there. And it's really there as our emergency phone for those situations. Yeah. Uh, and another one that people sometimes don't think about is, so the cell phone signals often get completely jammed locally uh, because so many people are trying to call both the EMS services, but also people trying to contact family. Uh, and basically what happens is the bandwidth gets burdened down and it's like when your internet bandwidth gets burdened up and all of a sudden your connection speed slows right down. But sending texts actually use really, really low bandwidth. So sometimes you can get a text message through uh, when a phone line can't get through. And to be honest, in that situation, you're doing everybody else a favor to send text messages instead of making phone calls because now we're, we're bringing down the amount of traffic um, mm -hmm. on the, the cell signals, which allows the most important calls from EMS and the people that are responsible for getting things up and going to go through, you know, and, and Emily actually introduced me to this other cool app that I've been playing with since. Uh, folks might want to check out called Zello. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned another one as well that they were using out in, in Texas and that you've used it, I think even at Standing Rock maybe. Well, yeah, Zello is what um, a lot of the organizing in Texas after the hurricane with relief and also here in Florida, a lot of folks have been using it. It's an app that can run over cell tower or over internet. So depending on um, the situation, I was certainly in a number of positions where the cell towers would work, but they would have low bandwidth or the cell wouldn't work, but I could get to um, my community's internet provider offered free wireless internet um, throughout the area in the days following following the hurricane so that folks could access Wi-Fi and get in touch with their loved ones when their personal electric was out. Um, and so I was able to use Zello to communicate with some family members during those times. Awesome. Yeah. So check out Zello. I just wrote the name Z-E-L-L-O. Um, and basically it's kind of like a walkie talkie app. And one of the other cool things that I really liked in seeing Zello is you can actually program it to have like your whole network of friends and family on it. Um, so imagine being in an emergency and even having multiple people that you want to get a hold of, or maybe you need to evac and go somewhere, or there's some real threat that's facing you, um, and you don't even know who the closest person is to get a hold of, to be able to literally hit one button and throw out a, a 10 second blast that goes to everybody uh, in your network all at once, as opposed to having to call people individually and does it with almost no bandwidth. Uh, it's a really cool program. Now you've got to remember that if Wi-Fi goes down, uh, it's gone. But in a lot of emergencies, you're not necessarily going to lose Wi-Fi. You know, you could have your power out in your house and still have Wi-Fi signals uh, from a cell tower that's got a good generator or maybe their power system just didn't go down. So uh, I think it is a cool one to think about checking out uh, and definitely playing with before the emergency happens. So um, I heard brownies is number two in there. <laughs> Would you have made more brownies or did you have enough brownies? I, there was definitely a brownie shortage across the neighborhood. <laughs> um, but really it was just, you know, thinking about like, we may be without power for some days and, you know, let's like, what can we 
you know, really thinking about like being without electricity, um, when you look at the scope of things, Chris, and you compare it to what happened in Hurricane Harvey, especially in neighborhoods outside of Houston, like Beaumont, or especially what happened in Hurricane Maria down in Puerto Rico to talk about being without power and um, having, you know, the like inconveniences of that and the annoyances of that. I mean, certainly I was living without electricity for about nine days in temperatures that were um, for sure reaching 100 degrees with the heat index. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, that is life threatening. We had some um, elderly folks in Florida who uh, passed away because the generators failed at their nursing homes and they were living mm. in such hot conditions. So, you know, for someone like me that's fairly healthy, that, you know, becomes an annoyance or an inconvenience. But um, thinking about like, even in those times, like the brownies and the um, just the ability to like keep our joy and give ourselves a little bit of sweetness um, to the soul during those inconveniences to help keep our spirits up. Awesome. Well, I said that jokingly, but I'm kind of serious at the same time, you know, in, in a really stressful situation, there is something to having a little bit of a comfort to, as, as a little like reset, you know. Uh, and I remember, I won't tell the story, but uh, having a trip in Mexico where we ended up in a really stressful situation. And mm -hmm. we actually brought an emergency chocolate bar that we stashed. And it was like, mm -hmm. this is for emergencies only. And we were completely overwhelmed and like literally scared. Uh, and it was like, oh my goodness, the chocolate bar. And mm -hmm. the three of us pulled out this chocolate bar. We sat down and we each had a couple pieces and that was like the like big giant breath that calmed everything down and allowed mm -hmm. us to get level-headed and, and actually make good decisions going forward you know so I said that jokingly but there, there is something to like you know building a couple little comforts into yeah. um, I guess a trigger to actually take a breath and, and slow your mind down a little bit and actually be a little bit more objective about you know where you're at and, and what your situation looks like so um, mm -hmm. another cool takeaway I just thought of here was thinking about um, for people to bring home so if you have parents uh, that are in, you know, say an old age home or a retirement living home, uh, maybe you've got family that's in, well, most hospitals certainly should, but potentially the old age homes and different places like that, it would be a really good question for you to go and ask if they have a backup generator there. Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly like to know if my grandparents were in a place that did not have a backup generator. Uh, and, you know, maybe the community could do a fundraiser to, to actually put in mm -hmm. a generator at the local senior citizens home, you know? Um, yeah, because a lot of places don't think about that, and and like you said, people lost lives because yeah. of a lack of, of power. And for us to sit, you know, 100 degrees um, for 10 days is uncomfortable, uh, but not life threatening for a healthy adult. Right. But for somebody with extended medical conditions, uh, it certainly could be right. So, um, so that's a cool takeaway right there, you know. Yeah, and I think you know, asking the larger asking the larger question there as well of their emergency preparedness plan. If there was, um, for instance, in our coastal communities, a lot of those cities um, were put under evacuation order by the governor when the storm was approaching, and you know, just really understanding um, for those for our loved ones what their emergency preparedness plans are as well for their caretakers. Sweet. So let's, let's move along now and chat. So I think people often, we focus a lot of attention on like the storm because it's the big dramatic part. Yeah. Uh, but really, you know, at the end of the day, um, people in Texas and Houston um, are still dealing with the consequences of Harvey and they're potentially even worse now for some people than they were in, in the heat of it, right? Yeah. Um, I've, been, I've, I've actually had a few communications early this morning with somebody that just got out of Puerto Rico, that was in Puerto Rico uh, with his family. Mm. Um, and he just flew to the San Juan Islands to drop his family off. And he's actually going back in to help. Um, mm. But he, when, in chatting with him this morning, I was trying to ask him some questions. And he said, you know more than I do. Like, we don't know anything. Uh, and this mm. emergency is just getting started in Puerto Rico. You know, the storm coming through was actually like, <laughs> it was actually nothing. That was the least. They're, they're expecting a lot more deaths from the aftermath than the initial yeah. hit, you know? Um, so, so what are some of your insights of what, what, what Florida looks like right now? Um, and I think maybe your area is not nearly as bad as some of the places like the South and the Keys. Um, but mm -hmm. what are some of the things you're seeing? What are some of the lessons and any insights that you have on things that would have been better to have in place or that we can do in the future uh, to make cool. sure we're able to adapt well? And, and I mean, that is the definition of resilience, right? How you bounce back. Absolutely. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on resilience in, in your witnessing of the aftermath of, of Hurricane Irma? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll paint a quick picture for the viewers. Um, I lived in central, I live in central Florida. Um, the hurricane came through south and central Florida and really all the way up through the east. 
Um, the folks in South Florida definitely dealt with a lot of devastation, whether it was wind, um, high winds coming through the Keys and blowing down structures, or a lot of coastal storm surges and just general rainfall creating flooding. So um, from South Florida, the Immokalee area and the Everglades, parts of Miami and Naples, all the way through the Keys, um, dealt with really various levels of serious devastation and damage. Um, folks down there are still... Um, really kind of trying to salvage what they can and a lot of them are um, either going to have to rebuild from scratch or are just picking themselves up and starting anew somewhere else. I have a student um, in the Keys who, you know, her in, in, we've had, I guess, about two weeks now, maybe two and a half weeks since the storm rolled through. And um, her house has really been engulfed in mold because um, her, her house had a, a fairly small flood when you look at the pictures in Harvey and Houston, um, but still enough of a flood that it really dampened the home. And when you don't have electricity on and climate control, and such heat and moisture in that environment, then the black mold just like grows in real quick. So a lot of folks right now are trying to salvage what they can and then either, you know, gut places and rebuild or, or move along, those that are able to. And then there's a lot of communities down there, especially those with a lot of migrant workers um, and farm workers who are dealing with, you know, really long-term devastation, chronic health issues, um, deaths, you know, like a lot of things being underreported. Up in my neck of the woods, I talk about it a lot, like the first word, world problems that we had. Um, most of the power has been restored to the Central Florida area, um, but there was about, throughout the state, there was about five and a half to six million gallons of sewage that was released into freshwater lakes or into our stormwater drinking water system. Um, when a state in the United States is under a declaration of emergency by the governor, then EPA standards are um, lessened or, or modified, so to speak. And so a lot of sewage um, that was spilled or released during the storm doesn't have to be remediated um, because of it being under an emergency disaster. So what this creates is a long-term environmental issue um, as well as a personal health issue um, in our entire state. Um, and in Central Florida, while the visible um, you know, effects of the hurricane are not nearly as catastrophic as they are in Hurricane Harvey, there's still a lot of infectious disease that's being bred by um, the sewage breaching into our water system and people taking showers with um, water that's, you know, then passing along bacterial infections or um, not being notified that they need to be boiling their drinking water. So that's been an issue. Um, in our area, there are communities where it's going to take between 30 and 60 days for hurricane debris to be picked up by public waste services. And so that decaying debris um, has a potential to um, breed disease in our garden, as well as, you know, certain other types of airborne diseases um, are rare, but still potentially possible. Um, and communication systems have still been a bit up and down in our area. So we have had pretty consistent cell phone service since the um, service was restored a few days after the hurricane, but internet services have been on for a few days and then off for a few hours, on for a few days, off for a few hours. Um, and things like that are obviously annoyances, but also for, you know, I think about people that are trying to work and keep their families alive and small businesses are really dealt with a, a huge brunt of um, extra weight and burden when they're trying to survive um, and you know pay for all their staff and their family members so um, so these types of annoyances are still really impacting um, especially the folks on the lowest end of the economic scale in our community so um, that's kind of a picture of what things are looking like right now yeah, yeah, that, there's a bunch of stuff that come up for me in there, uh, thinking about it. So the mold being a big one, you know, a lot of people maybe not thinking about that and how serious that can be, even long-term health implications. Uh, one thing that comes to mind with me, and obviously uh, this, you have to have the budget to do this, you know, so whether this is something you can afford to do proactively or it's a long-term plan to, to try and save up and put this in place. Uh, but, you know, if your basement is potentially going to be prone to flooding, it's really be worthwhile thinking about how can you dry it out really quick, you know? Yeah. Um, and if I was in an area that was potentially going to see more hurricanes, I would want to think about having maybe a couple of dehumidifiers and a couple of fans before the storm comes on. So the moment that I have power back, or even better, I've got a generator, uh, and the moment the storm goes, I'm drying stuff out right away, you know? Yeah. Um, so mold seems like a big one. You talked about water contamination, uh, and I believe you were telling me that there's a, there's a bit of a, a cholera outbreak happening right now, is there as well? Or maybe not an outbreak, but... 
Certainly the evidence of it, yeah. Certainly a number of cases have been reported in my community, which is like a fairly urban community, like I said, that wasn't touched as, as bad as some of the other spots. Yeah, so the potential for disease, uh, even uh, contamination of agricultural crops in the soil. Um, that's interesting thinking if all of this flood water from the streets is picking up, you know, runoff and all these things, and then that's flowing through agriculture fields, throwing through people's gardens. Um, yeah. Might make me think a little bit designing gardens uh, and, and maybe mm. swale systems even around them um, so mm -hmm. that water can be redirected when there's too much water uh, to mm -hmm. not contaminate soil and stuff like that, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, I also think about like, you know, mm -hmm. having some sort of backup valve going into your, uh, your own house, because um, how terrible would that be if all of this toxic water backs up into uh, your taps, right? Um, mm -hmm. And now even when the clean water is back on again, you've now got bacteria growing inside of your pipes. Yeah. Absolutely. And that brings up for me, you know, one of the kind of tips that we do in Florida before a hurricane is we fill up our bathtub with water so that if we're without water, we have access to some. Um, and for some people, especially if they're on well water and their electricity goes down, then their pump goes down so they can't get the fresh water. So that's one tip. But also, even for someone like me living in a city on a public municipal sewer system, um, part of filling up so much water beforehand was... Um, having access to clean water, not knowing what the condition of my water, what the state of my water is going to look like afterwards. So filling up a good, healthy amount of it, an abundant amount of it before the storm in case there are sewage breaches like this afterwards. Yeah. So, so you're a herbalist um, yeah. by, by trade, spent a bunch of time with Rosemary Gladstar, an amazing lady I would love to meet one day and, and do a bunch of training. You had mentioned uh, that you had a formula, formula that you use for mold. Uh, with vinegar and essential oils uh, and you said on porous surfaces was it or, or yeah so there's a misconception that bleach is the best ingredient to get rid of mold after a, a flood or situation like this or you know a hurricane where your roof is damaged and the rain comes in for several hours until you can get a tarp up there and um, bleach is only good on non-porous surfaces so your countertops and your sinks and things like that bleach is great when you're looking at your curtains or you're looking at the beams behind your drywall or things like this the the bleach isn't going to do um, nearly enough and and as I was speaking with some other herbalists about today, we also need to look at what we're putting into this really sensitive, delicate water system as, you know, runoff from our remediation of after a storm. So um, what I work with the most is white vinegar. And I like to, a lot of people will just use white vinegar um, on its own for mold remediation. But I like to work with, especially camphor essential oil, camphor cinnamomum camphora is an Asian tree that has become invasive in my area of Florida. And so I have an abundance of that plant material. It's really easy for me to um, distill the essential oil of it. So I have abundance of that essential oil. Um, but I know folks in other parts of the Gulf Coast that work with a lot of different types of essential oil, tea tree, and even some of the mints like peppermint and spearmint or citrus mm. with all the limoline in yep. it um, and use those uh, kind of blends. So um, I think just understanding, you know, some of these like um, longstanding misconceptions around some of the toxic chemicals that we have to use that aren't necessarily even uh, as effective as some of the more natural approaches. Yeah, we had a really interesting experience with a tent where we were using bleach to try and get rid of mildew in the tent and it actually made it worse in the end. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize that bleach actually feeds mildew uh, to some yeah. degree anyways. Uh, we kept spraying it and every time we sprayed it, it got worse. So that was an interesting lesson. Um, yeah. Hey, can you, can you type camphor in the chat so people yeah, know how to Yeah, I sure spell? can. Yeah, awesome. Um, what about any other herbal tricks uh, that you thought might be, were helpful in this storm or could be helpful in other situations? Yeah, well, Chris, you and I talked a lot about some of the common like first aid situations that we get into in any type of, um, you know, natural or city disaster, um, you know, the scrapes on our knees. And um, I had a girlfriend that we were cleaning up after the storm that um, the machete got a little too close to her leg. And so we had to tend to that. And so some of our basic first aid herbs, I think about yarrow. Um, for cuts and for bleeding and for fevers. I think about um, uh, uh, plantain, plantago um, for healing wounds or comfrey, things like that. Um, but I was also sharing with you some of the 
really beautiful herbs that kept us um, having our sanity through uh, some of the stress, like having chamomile tea and having some lavender in a sachet or an essential oil to, I mean, help get some sleep at night. Certainly the night of the storm, those were my big allies. Um, I wanted to be alert and awake through the storm, but I also didn't want to be just completely on edge all night long listening to the wind. I wanted to be able to maintain my center so that if I was listening to the wind and then I heard a big tree crack that I could, you know, keep on my toes and not be all frazzled. Um, so thinking about your your nervines, your basic herbs like chamomile or linden, um, some of those nighttime herbs that we love to use, lemon balm to help us keep our cool um, in our spirit. Those were, I think, some of the really big ones. Awesome. Uh, another one that comes to mind for me that I think would be in my kind of like top five herbs maybe for emergency disaster would be something like wormwood uh, and thinking about uh, the digestive issues that are likely to come up, you know, coming out of it, parasites, uh, stomach bacteria, all that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think about wormwood, black walnut would be really mm -hmm. potent ones. Uh, yeah. And then, oh, go for it. I was just going to say, we've been using a lot of activated charcoal with the folks that are dealing with cholera and so, or potential cholera, dealing for sure with some of these digestive dysenteries. Yeah. Yeah, and if you can imagine, uh, well, I'm thinking back to Hurricane Harvey here and seeing all of these pictures of people wading through the floodwaters in the streets to get to evacuate their house, going to save people. But uh, imagine, you know, you've got like a little nick on your finger that would not be a big deal any other time. But now you're wading through, you know, borderline toxic water or, or really toxic water. Uh, yeah. And infections are going to become a real big deal, you know. And if yeah. pharmacies aren't opening up again the next day uh, and hospitals are full, that can become really serious if you're not being proactive. Uh, so even spending a bit of time, you know, is a proactive trick to learn about, you know, what are some of the top herbs for managing infection? Mm -hmm. How do you clean a wound out properly? You know, I would be extra, extra careful, you know, about irrigating all my wounds. Uh, and even just, you know, uh, getting a, whether you get a little syringe that you can spray water with, or you can even get a Ziploc bag and cut a little hole in the bottom, mm -hmm. throw a half tablespoon of salt in there, uh, and then just squeeze the Ziploc bag. And then you're irrigating your wound with a saline solution, you know, and then if you add herbs mm -hmm. to that or a little bit of iodine, uh, but I think wound management, just being hyper vigilant and proactive would be super important in those situations. Because um, the last thing you want is, you know, a, a finger being lost or even someone dying from a cut on their finger uh, because they're, they're moving through waters. And, and, you know, I wonder a lot of folks maybe don't think a lot about uh, wound management outside of going to see their doctor for antibiotics. And I feel like herbs are actually incredibly powerful in dealing with onset infections or a lot of types of infections anyways. So yeah. um, honey as well, a huge one, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to go for too, too much longer here. We've been chatting for a bit. Uh, it's been nice seeing all the people popping up on Facebook. Uh, maybe I'll ask people at this point, if you've got any questions that you want to mm -hmm. write in the, the chat box for, for Emily at this point, uh, and I'll kind of jump back and forth between here and Facebook. But maybe if you wanted to chat a little bit about what, one of the things that I've been really inspired about in hearing and, and getting to know you a little bit, Emily, has been... Uh, all the work that you've been doing to try and provide resources for other people and communities. Um, and it seemed like uh, you had some really amazing lessons that came out of the, the shooting that happened in Orlando there, the nightclub mm -hmm. shooting, uh, and the start of your Orlando grief care project. Um, so I'm wondering if you want to share a little bit about, you know, some of the big lessons that you had in responding to that and some of your thoughts. So uh, Las Vegas mm -hmm. is on everybody's mind right mm -hmm. now. Um, and, and you were sharing a couple of thoughts with me on, you know, what your advice to people is even on what they can do with what happened in Las Vegas on a, on a local level right now. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just pass it over to you there. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And I'm, um, it's really, um, I just want to, uh, honor the folks that, um, lost their lives in the Pulse Orlando shooting and also the folks in Las Vegas and all the families in both of those cities who are, um, right now, you know, grieving and um, going through their process. Um, I will just really quickly, the Orlando Grief Care Project was something that was started last June in Orlando after the Pulse nightclub shooting. A small group of herbalists from my school in Florida um, started to attend some community vigils uh, just with some extra herbs that we had in our closet, apothecary, some rose and some lavender and some chamomile, some of the herbs that I just mentioned to you to help keep our calm and keep our cool. And um, we, uh, herbalists outside of Orlando, began to hear about the work we were doing and started to send herbs our way that we could distribute. And so through the last year, we've um, reached over 7,500 people with herbs specifically to help soothe 
trauma and grief and help people move through those processes as well as facilitating classes and trainings for people in the community here in Orlando as well as for grief counselors and first responders to know more about different holistic approaches to grief and trauma. And as we started to receive herbs last year, um, we began to um, receive more resources than the communities that we were already connected to. And so we started to branch out. And one of the big communities that we began to work with and build relationships Relationships with were first responders in our area. And I had shared with Chris and with the folks up in Canada at Heartwood about some of the creative ways that I was able to go to fire stations and go to police stations and um, get some of these holistic remedies into the hands of folks that, of course, are, are bearing the biggest burden during some of these big tragedies, but also every single day in every single one of our communities are dealing with some you know, seeing some of the most intense traumas that they can't unsee, like um, folks that are, you know, like first responders going to a call of a shooting or a car accident or a tragedy involving a child, you know, so many ways that these first responders in our community not only save our lives, but also hold the stories of these mm -hmm. tragedies in really intimate ways. And I was just sharing with Chris, um, you know, we reached a lot of people in Orlando um, thanks to the generosity of the larger herbal community supporting our work. I've gone now to about 20 different communities and cities outside of Orlando and taught a little bit about our work to try to pass along the templates of what we used and the toolkits and the lessons of that project so that folks in these communities can um, be better equipped to respond in their own communities to different tragedies. Um, Charlottesville, Virginia was one of those cities that I was able to visit last fall and then herbalists there started the botanical mobile herbal clinic that was in place and immediately ready to respond when the rally in Charlottesville happened this summer and the young woman lost her life in that crime and so um, now we're, we're looking at what's happened in Las Vegas and we're seeing a very similar um, incident of course on a much larger scale than what we experienced in Orlando with a mass shooting and I've been contacted in dozens and dozens of times in this week um, by folks um, who want to know what they can do for Las Vegas and I and a number of herbalists are in communication with folks there and are starting to have conversations around um, how we can support that community through this main Major, major time of grief and also the the healing that the long journey of healing that will follow um, but I I've really um, appreciated the opportunity in these conversations to also lift up that each of us that's on social media that sees a photo or watches a video or a testimony or hears the stories of what happens in Las Vegas it touches all of us that are humans and have hearts, but there are especially any of us that have gone through a violent crime or our first responders working in these types of communities or um, are living in a place like Orlando or Sandy Hook that was touched by its own tragic shooting. Um, I was explaining to Chris that kind of like the band-aid over the wounds on our heart is kind of ripped off and we're feeling really raw and tender again. And so I just want to encourage those folks that are watching today that are thinking, what can I do for Las Vegas? Um, I invite you to look at your own community and who in your community is being touched by witnessing what's happening in Las Vegas. Um, who in your community might be a first responder that is dealing with their own trauma or maybe this particular shooting um, brings back images and smells and sounds of a shooting that they attended to or responded to. Um, you know, where in our community are these larger tragedies coming home and really touching us in, in tender ways and how can we as herbalists and um, you know folks working with the earth and working with plants, how can we just reach out in these um, more intimate local relationships? Because I was sharing with Chris that whether it was through Orlando and the Pulse shooting or through Hurricane Irma, it was the strong relationships that I have with my neighbors and individuals in my community that allow have allowed me to keep a level head through these anxious times and have also given me the most practical practical, tangible resources to feel resilient and prepared through some of these emergencies. And so when we hit a tragedy like Las Vegas, how can we look to our own hearts and, and the immediate relationships we have and, and foster some healing in those? So it's a bit of a, a long-winded rambling answer, but um, I think it's most important right now that we look to our own communities and see how can we help as well as what is our larger response to the folks in Las Vegas. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful message there, you know, and as, as simple as that sounds, I think it's super relevant and, and something that we could forget. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, Nikki, she's a friend of mine. I think you met Nikki at mm -hmm. uh, hey, Nikki. Uh, Heartwood Gathering. 
uh, just wrote, hey, you just reminded me to go make a cup of chamomile tea to calm down a little bit. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> relax. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes those little reminders about the simple thing are, are super helpful as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it kind of makes me, I mean, there's a couple things that come to mind for me on that question. Uh, you know, and one of them is, um, you know, learning the actual skill sets uh, to help us adapt and cope better. Um, and I'll maybe post the link afterwards, but I, it's, it's kind of ironic, literally a year almost to the date, a little less, uh, I guess. Um, I made a video about safety in crowds and just some common sense things to think about when you're walking through a crowd. Um, I was down at the Royal Winter Fair in Toronto, and I think about that stuff all the time, just naturally, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and in reflecting on what happened in Vegas, a lot of the stuff that I, I shared in that, I actually think would have been really, really relevant. And I've been studying some of the case studies of some of the people that, uh, that made it out and, and managed to make really good decisions and not just completely mm -hmm. panic. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, putting a little bit as scary as it is, putting a little bit of forethought into some of those things ahead of time, uh, and learning some of the skill sets, uh, I feel like that, uh, can allow us to have a more optimistic, uh, approach to life, you know? Um, to actually know what to do ahead of time. And then that other part, I feel like the optimism message is just huge, you know, because if we get overcome by fear and doom, then, you know, what's the point of doing all this anyways, in my mind, you know? Um, and, I, and I really feel that we're being bombarded with that in the media. So it's huge to, for us in our own communities to not succumb to this message of doom and gloom and fear and to chat about being proactive and, and to remember all those beautiful things in life too, you know, uh, which I really appreciate your message there. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. Uh, one message that came off of Facebook here was just, um, is there anything you learned from this experience uh, that would apply if a, a disaster happened really quickly and you didn't have a kind of warning system ahead of time? So coming out of what you learned from Irma, let's say an earthquake quake struck mm -hmm. or Oregon right now. Um, are, are there any lessons that you would take away and apply to that scenario? Yeah, I, well, I think the biggest thing for me, Chris, is like, how would I let my mom know I'm okay? <laughs> and because that was the biggest thing for me after the hurricane. And um, so again, reiterating that when it when you see on an emergency checklist, having a family communication plan, that doesn't just mean having a little laminated card with everyone's phone number on it, but really thinking about who, like, where's the phone tree? Who's your backup um, for communication? Like, how how do we get in touch with our loved ones during times when some of our normal communication systems have gone down? Um, and I, I don't know. I actually am confident that I don't have a really good answer because I don't have a good family communication plan in place yet. But it's been one of the big priorities um, for me that I've talked about with my family as well as with some of my close friends and neighbors um, for their own benefit as well as for me being able to stay in communication with them. How can we be sure that when these emergencies come up um, that we are super prepared and then I think the other thing, Chris, is that you shared with me a great resource um, from your school regarding like emergency preparedness packs. Um, and one thing that Hurricane Irma really reminded me is that I should have a very small like fanny pack with me at all times, like in my car and then like, when I'm checking, you know, getting onto an airplane and like just to have like I, I, I hadn't been carrying around like waterproof matches and a compass. And like if I was in a place like Oregon where I'm not familiar and I, you know, have very little things on me, like having this very few um, immediate need type of tools on me. Um, and it wasn't, it was really when I started to venture outside of my home and my neighborhood outside of Irma and the electric grid was still down and the gas had not been delivered to the area and people were kind of on the edge and we weren't really sure. We hadn't heard how the rest of the state was faring. Um, I, I felt very uncomfortable leaving without having that small satchel with me just in case. Um, and so that was a really good lesson to to be thinking about long term as well. Awesome. Yeah, I think communications plan would be a huge one as well. I mean, from my uh, consulting work in professional emergency and disaster management, even in amongst like governments and stuff, that's the first system to fall apart in a disaster, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all kinds of little things you can do. And I, I want to do a whole piece on that on changing world. So stay tuned in the future. I, I want to dive into that topic really big. Um, but maybe I'll just throw out a couple of my kind of top ones there. You know, one thing Emily and I chatted about before the storm, uh, just pre-arranging ahead of time with some of your family members what the actual game plan is if you've got no phone line. Um, and I think about the story of, cool, maybe mom lives, you know, a half an hour walk away or a half an hour drive or whatever, and I live over here. And uh, an emergency happens, there's an earthquake, and both are like, oh my goodness, we need to see each other. And what if you both head out into the danger zone to come find each other, and then you don't cross paths, and now you're both uh, in a more dangerous situation. You would have been safer at home. 
you get to the other person's house and they're not there and now you're panicked and it's it's terrifying you know mm -hmm. so even as something as simple as like hey mom if an emergency happens you stay put i'm coming to you if i can you know um, we talked about having a communication person outside of your own town because uh, local signals may be completely jammed, but you may be able to get a message over to another city not affected by the disaster, you know? So if everybody in your community or plan has a contact person in a neighboring town, uh, that's a super useful thing to have, you know? Setting up something like Zello, um, that we chatted about at the beginning of the talk here, you know, to be able to send out kind of mass messages really quickly with low bandwidth. Uh, you had some radios um, that you, you actually used mm -hmm. for one of your heartwood gather or sorry, your herbal gatherings and mm -hmm. passed out amongst friends before the storm. But how useful would that even be to pass out amongst neighbors? Uh, having some sort of hand crank or battery operated radio uh, is a big one. Uh, and then I think being proactive is, is absolutely huge and noticing things ahead of time if you have the option. Within an earthquake, you know, or, or something like the shooting, you don't necessarily. Uh, but in a lot of situations, you do, you know. Um, and even in some shootings and stuff, you know, if you're actually being alert and aware, there are pre-indicators of, of stuff about to happen, you know. Um, totally. So, so just being, uh, you know, I feel like we're... I want to. I was going to say we're in a time where we need to be more proactive, but I actually feel like that's been how we've been forever, and we've gone through this little blip in history where we've allowed ourselves to get complacent. Uh, yeah. And it's actually not about we need to be proactive now. It's more about we need to go back to how we always have been as humans, uh, and just being a little bit more aware all the time. You know, living in a heightened place of awareness, which actually allows us to catch all kinds of other beautiful things, and is going to enhance our lives in other incredible ways, way beyond emergencies, anyways. You know, so. Awesome. Well, maybe we can wrap up here. Uh, I don't see any other questions popping up here. So if anyone, this is your last chance, throw one in the chat box if you got it. Um, but maybe we can just go out. Uh, we were chatting about a couple of cool organizations doing great work. So you've dropped a couple of names already. Uh, but if people want to learn about people doing awesome work in related to everything we're chatting about tonight, uh, if anyone on here actually feels called to, to make some donations to help out um, with some of the recovery that's happening down south, uh, what are some of the organizations that you really love and you're seeing do great grassroots uh, work on the ground and really, really help people? Yeah, I'd love to lift up the folks at Gulf Coast Herbal Aid um, who are working um, throughout the Gulf Coast, um, of course, really centering a lot of their efforts in Houston and the surrounding communities like Beaumont that have been so touched, but also um, mobilizing in Florida and Louisiana. You know, we've got another tropical storm coming up through the Gulf right now. Um, so Gulf Coast Herbal Aid uh, has been spearheading a lot of the really amazing community-centered efforts that are taking place in Texas right now. And then Chris also uh, introduced me to a group called Shelterbox um, that I uh, had recently actually yesterday heard Chris that they were doing some work um, for Puerto Rico, um, which is um, hopefully we all know by now has really been um, devastated and withheld a lot of aid. And um, so hopefully we can turn a lot of our attention and resources there to help them um, get through these really intense transitionary times. Um, but, uh, the, yeah, shelter box folks, you can say more about them, Chris. It seems like they're doing great work. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know a ton about shelter box. Uh, I heard about them through a friend of mine, Kate, um, who's doing a big fundraiser for them in Toronto. Um, but basically they go into disaster ridden areas and they come in with, um, basically portable shelter systems, uh, to give to families. You know, when I think about Puerto Rico where everything's wiped out. Uh, and they basically have these little packages that they drop off that give you a tent with and not just like a flimsy Canadian tire tent, like with really solid walls. Um, they actually have systems set up so you can build water catchment systems right into your tent. Uh, and then they give you a little box that has like a water purification filter in it and there's some rope and some axes and shovels. Uh, they've got multiple different types of kits that they have in these boxes that they call shelter boxes. Uh, and their mandate is basically raising money to come in after a disaster. Um, and drop off these, these shelter boxes. So in situations, and I think about this organization particularly, working with some of the people that don't have, uh, you know, Emily keeps referring to like the first world problems of Orlando in this kind of situation, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and shelter box, you know, for the people of Puerto Rico where there's, there's nothing left and there is maybe no means to have put some of these things in place ahead of time that we're chatting about tonight. Uh, they really do some amazing work there, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, big shout out to them. I shared a link uh, for Shelterbox in the discussion here and on uh, Facebook there. So check those folks out. And, um, yeah, awesome. So nice to have you in here, Emily. Um, 
Thanks for coming thanks, up. Joe. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. These are really important conversations and I'm really heartened and uplifted in my practice of optimism by being able to learn from Chris and share with all of you and learn from all of you. And so um, definitely keep these conversations happening. And I just want to give a big shout out to Chris and the Changing World Project and all of the amazing resources and education that um, he has available on that website and hopefully he can plug us into any of the other links that we should be following there. But um, just want to say thanks, Chris, because um, all those blogs and webinars and videos that you have up and have been sharing have been really helpful for folks like me to feel like we can be prepared and that we can face these changing times with um, a lot of hope. So thanks for your work. Awesome. Yeah. And I, there's plan on lots more coming out in the next year. Uh, I feel like momentum's just really starting to pick up here. Um, and I'm really looking for people that have really cool, creative, innovative ideas that are involved in really neat projects. You know, if you want to come on and, and do an interview like this, uh, to chat about a cool project or cool ideas that you're working on, uh, if you want to jump on the blog and share thoughts on anything related to this topic, uh, this is all about a conversation, you know. Uh, so please come be part of the conversation. So good night, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot. Safe travels out west, Emily. And uh, I look forward to picking up the conversation with you as well. That's right. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night. Okay, cheers.